Good afternoon. My name is Patrice Milos, and it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Um, this is a unique opportunity for me, um, as it's one of the first presentations that Claritas Genomics has had the opportunity to present to you all um, about the company, who we are, what we're doing, um, and it's, it's an, an exciting time. To give you a little bit of a background on myself, I'm Patrice Milos. I joined Claritas in May of this year, joining as the Chief Executive Officer of Claritas Genomics. We are a pediatric molecular genetics company focused very much on um, integrating cutting edge next generation sequencing technology with our ability to diagnose and lead to new treatments for pediatric disease. So I'll be telling you about that today. My overview of my presentation is such that I'll talk a little bit about why pediatric genetics is so important today, um, what's unique about it. Um, overlay that with the exponential increase that we've seen in sequencing technologies that have enabled us to be where the field is today, along with our growing knowledge of the application of that technology to the field, uh, the knowledge, the growing knowledge of the field of human disease genetics, as well as the now evolving use of genetic testing, much of which is what has been um, described or going on in the conference to which you are participating and listening. And then our ability to translate that knowledge that we are generating with our physicians for pediatric health care and a real understanding of the key differentiators of who Claritas Genomics is. Just so you know, I will be um, attempting to address questions at various points throughout the presentation. Um, although, since this format is new to me, I'll see how that goes as we move along. So, I think I start with this slide because it really begins to describe why the time is now for the application of pediatric molecular diagnostics. And it really results from the fact that our knowledge of human disease genetics is rapidly growing. And if you look at this data that was recently published in the uh, Canadian Journal of Cardiology, it shows you a nice representation of the variants that have been reported in the human gene mutation database. And the exponential increase of that knowledge with now variants reported in HGMD far exceeding 10,000 um, variants the majority of those which lead to a disease causation in an individual who carries um, those uh, a, a rare or a, a mutation in a particular disease gene. I was struck um, by um, the, the knowledge that we are gaining in our understanding of human disease genetics when I read two papers that appeared in Science Express in, uh, during the month of July, in which two Science Express articles were published online, in which gene therapy was used to correct two different disease syn syndromes in um, young children. Now, granted, these were um, uh, uh, gene therapy using a lentil viral um, infection, uh, transduction of hemopoietic stem cells in only three patients in the case of the Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome and another syndrome that I'll describe. But what was amazing to me was the fact that we knew the mutation that existed in these patients. In the case of WAS, this is an inherited immunodeficiency caused by mutations in the gene encoding um, WASP a protein regulating the cytoskeleton, which leads to extremely um, debilitating and early um, uh, loss of children's lives that have this condition. In this gene therapy correction, however, um, the correction of the genetic effect following stem cell transduction 
with a wild type WAS protein allowed the correction and production of this protein, which was deficient, as you'll see in patient one, two, and three above. Um, the mutation in the WAS was exonic in the case of the first individual resulting in an amino acid change, a deletion, and um, also another amino acid change, which resulted in expression of the protein at levels um, less than 5% of what would be expected in those young um, infant children. Um, the stem cell tra transduction of um, cells isolated from a bone marrow um, resulted in a, a, a very high efficiency of transduction um, of the wild type protein at vector copy numbers that ranged between one and three copies per genome of these um, children following reintroduction into the child. And then um, production, as you'll see in the graph represented on the bottom, of near um, normal levels of expression of the WAS protein in both lymphocytes and platelets in these children. An amazing um, effect that is seen, and granted only three children, However, when we think about the correlation of understanding who the child is with the genetic defect and our ability to subsequently correct that defect with expression of the wild type protein, it, it just represented a remarkable um, publication for me as I took on this new role as CEO for Claritas Genomics. The same, again, uh, in the same Science Express for metachromatic like leukodystrophy. This is a major um, lysostor lysostormal, lysosomal storage disease caused by ARSA deficiency that results in um, demyelination of, of neurons of the brain and major loss of uh, neuromotor function. And again, near uh, D, D um, inability of these children to to progress and function um, and an early um, uh, death for these children. Again, three patients. I'm showing the genetic correction of these um, proteins now introduced in bone marrow, the reproduction of the ARSA, um, the lysosomal storage defect correction, and what you see most remarkably on the bottom right hand is the uh, brain morphology of one of the patients um, following some 25 months of gene therapy where you have near normal um, uh, images, radiological images of the brain. And on the far right, the debilitating brain um, pathology, histology of an, a child who would um, be progressing um, normally with this disease. So again, remarkable correction in the ability to deliver a wild type protein to a normally deficient um, patients, in this case only three, but again, remarkable um, findings. So what I'd like to do is just give you a view of, you know, what has happened since really the achievements of the Human Genome Project delivered in the early um, 2000 timeframe and where we are today. Clearly, the course that we are after at Claritas Genomics is our ability to use this information for um, really translating and better informing patient care in our pediatric patient population. Um, and we have a firm belief that the time is now to translate this to our physicians and to the bedside. Clearly, the historical perspective as early as 1902, a disorder of metabolism of phenylalanine and tyrosine was identified with inborn errors of metabolism by a, a, a physician, um, Archibald Gerard, at the time where it was known as disorders of joints and heart valves, curious darkening of the urine, which was the result of the uh, metabolic disorder in that patient. Um, treatment with dietary restriction allowed you to restore the um, metabolism. And that was early as uh, 1902 without a clear understanding of the genetic basis of that. 
Technology combined with our knowledge of phenotype, obviously technology advancements have been staggering. If we look at the plot provided by National Human Genome Research Institute, the dramatic decline in the cost of sequencing per genome has truly been staggering. And this was coupled at a time with the ability to introduce next-gen sequencing and our ability to use that at a research scale that has been really bringing the cost down. However, I think there's also a pause that's needed at this time in thinking about not only the cost per base, but also the level of cost and accuracy that's needed for translating this into clinical information. Sequencing of the Mendelium obviously has been occurring over the last few years. This was an initial publication by Stephen Kingsmore, which talked about carrier testing for severe childhood recessive diseases using next generation sequencing published a little bit over um, two years ago. Um, sequencing exomes of known genes, sequencing of an exome, interpreting regions of interest for recessive childhood diseases. Again, very much in a research mode for uh, research discovery of those um, mutations. Again, sequencing to diagnose rare disorders. This was a uh, dysmorphic syndrome of which exome sequencing, um, again, by colleagues Deborah Nickerson, uh, Jay Shinduri, my, uh, uh, Sarah Negg at uh, Washington University, um, really identified the cause of a Mendelius disorder in, in this, um, these two individuals, again, using exome sequencing. And that really has um, just progressed now with more and more of novel gene discoveries, causative mutations being found in these rare um, individuals that present with unique phenotypes. And um, that will just continue with a research exome. And now clinical exomes truly coming into there for our both gene discovery and that rapid trajectory that we saw in the first slide where numerous rare Mendelian disorders are now being elucidated on um, an ever ongoing basis. Um, I'm just going to pause just to see if there are any questions. No questions at this point, so let's move on. So the question really that we at Claritas pose is, how do we translate discoveries of the genetic cause of disease, the genetic basis of disease, to our patients? And really, um, uh, a broad audience of not only children, but adults as well. And so it really enters the realm of genetic testing. So today, the American Medical Association classifies genetic testing in three different categories. Diagnostic testing, whether an individual has a genetic disease. And today, we estimate that there are more than 4,000 diseases that are caused by single gene mutations. And the rapid um, elucidation of those, I think today we probably have well over 1,500, if not 2,000 genes that are now known to be caused by, by um, single gene mutations and what those mutations are. Predictive medicine, determining whether an individual has an increased risk for a particular disease is another classification. And then pharmacogenomics, obviously an area of great interest. This is an area where I've spent a great deal of time in my prior um, careers, um, starting the pharmacogenomics group at Pfizer Pharmaceuticals in 1996, and really working with colleagues at Pfizer to, to actually implement and begin to think about how this could be used, not only in drug um, development, but also in drug discovery, and understanding how you tailor an individual's genetic makeup to whether a drug is suitable for a particular patient and what would be the safest and most efficacious dose. And clearly, there's a growing interest in this area now, and I think more and more pharmaceutical companies today are embracing this. Combined with all the genetic elucidation of disease and pharmacogenomics is the opportunity to use molecular testing. And we see a tremendous increase in the uh, diseases for which testing is available today, 
that disease number is closely approaching, if not already approaches um, 3,000. And the number of laboratories shown um, in the lower portion um, has pretty much remained steady during the course of probably the last um, uh, five to seven years. What's interesting is you see many laboratories entering the space, um, leaving the space, um, but a steady group of companies that are working in a CLIA setting um, attempting to use molecular testing for either diagnosing disease or oncology in particular. Um, but it is definitely um, uh, an active area of investment and also um, clinical utility. The ability and the use of genetic testing, obviously, um, more than 1,200 genetic tests are available to the physicians to aid in diagnosis and therapeutic decisions for, again, over a 1,000 diseases, and I'd say that's even significantly more. Genetic testing is performed for a variety of reasons, um, confirming the diagnosis of symptoms, um, pre-symptomatic testing for estimating risk. We see an increase in um, prenatal diagnostic screening that's been driven, again, very much by next-generation sequencing and companies like uh, Sequinome. Um, and a variety of other testing methodologies. What's interesting is the costs and complexity for the average physician um, are increasing. Um, some Sanger tests today can be more than $15,000. Um, even single gene tests can be pricing upwards of $5,900. A clinical exome can cost $7,500. A clinical genome can be $12,000. Getting an answer may not be definitive, and in some cases, the rate of getting a successful answer may be only 25%. So what we're seeing is there's cost pressures in the healthcare system um, to contain these costs, but yet we know how valuable they can be. So Claritas Genomics has entered this um, space at, because we see an important opportunity to build um, not just one company, but a company that represents a pediatric network across the pediatric community to really help pediatric physicians to better diagnose and understand disease of patients. So a little background on who we are, um, what we do is really will follow. We are a clinical pediatric genetic testing laboratory. We have been in existence as a, um, a CLIA-certified genetic diagnostic laboratory operating within Boston Children's Hospital for um, well over 10 years. We are now launched as an independent company. I'll talk more about that. But our goal really is the best quality services from helping a physician to decide what do I order, here are the symptoms of my patient, how do I confirm these symptoms through an understanding with client services around pre-ordering all the way through testing and then a quality of an interpretive genomic post report given back to that physician. We test for a whole variety of conditions. They're uh, available on our um, website, our test menu found there. I'll talk about a few of those. I think what makes Claritas Genomics unique as a genetic diagnostic laboratory is the close partnership we have built with the clinical and genetic expertise from pediatric hospitals for test development and for interpretation of results that emerge from our test offerings. We offer single gene tests, we offer gene panels, and today to the Boston um, Children's Hospital community, we offer research exomes, although the goal is uh, clinical exomes at some point when we view the time is right. We also have a, a fascinating and a proprietary copy number variation test in the clinical laboratory with a special emphasis on autism spectrum disorders that I'll talk about later. We are optimizing our um, testing laboratory for uh, the Life Technologies Ion Proton platform um, for our next-gen sequencing that will be scalable and offered, and I'll talk more about that with you. 
So what Claritas, again, aims to do is build a network through our services and um, really focusing on an interface that enables our community to really address the challenges and opportunity of clinical use of next-gen sequencing. That is, this is a major investment that Boston Children's Hospital could not do alone. There's a complexity of the measurement. There's a complexity of the interpretation. There's an understanding of the optimal clinical utility. How do we utilize this information? How do we build a consensus around reimbursement that these tests are important? That we really offer an optimal clinical report for our physicians and their patients. We provide support services and exploration and also a forum for discovery. So it's really focused on the right question, the right test, and the right answer for patients. Our management team and our key members, myself as the uh, chief executive officer, bring more than 18 years of pharmaceutical experience and experience of genomics and medicine. My passion has really driven me to be at the cutting edge of technology as it applies to medicine. I bring pharma experience, but I also spent um, greater than four years as the chief scientific officer at Helicose Biosciences, a single molecule DNA sequencing company that um, really found the marriage of my passion with medicine and um, next-gen sequencing. Um, Mary Ellen Cortesis has worked at Boston Children's Hospital overseeing the clinical laboratory management and operations here at Boston Children's and now with us at Claritas and was a co-founder. Rajana Bachman is our chief business officer, years of experience as a business development director, specializing in corporate collaborations, was a co-founder. And then key partners with us, Peter Park, Tim Yu, some of the world's foremost experts in medical informatics, visionary leaders, informatics experts, Tim Yu, a practicing physician who sees patients and knows just what our data can do for his patients. And then my good colleague, David Margulies, he and I have worked together in years past, um, has really been an entrepreneur in the medical and information systems um, community. He founded Corellian Diagnostic, founder of Cerner Care Insight, which was later sold to form um, WebMD, and is a co-founder of Claritas Genomics. He sits on our board. He remains at Boston Children's Hospital as the executive director of the Gene Partnership Initiative. Our board of directors is chaired by Bob Higgins, um, a well-known, um, successful venture um, capital um, individual um, at Highland Capital and has done much in the healthcare community. He's a professor at Harvard Business School and just a great colleague to work with. David, Ronnie Andrews sits on our board of directors and is president of medical sciences at Life Technologies as the former CEO of Clariant, Clariant and a lifelong um, um, career in the medical diagnostic community. Brings much intellectual capital, know-how, leadership, and everything to our board and myself, and then we have board observers, Eric Halverson, well-known in the Boston community and innovation as director of Tito at BCH, and Mark Gardner from Light Technologies. Our funding and how we arose, really we arose out of Boston Children's Hospital DNA Diagnostic Laboratory. Again, a successful history of over 10 years in a CLIA certified laboratory offering DNA services that is really unknown to the external community. And our job is to really tell the story, build the partnerships, and build a network where we can bring what we do to the broader pediatric community. We have major investments from Life Technologies and um, other investments um, ongoing and building partnerships with major pediatric hospitals in the US. And we're also actively working to partner with community or country health centers, excuse me. As we take our knowledge, not just to the US, but also countries who are interested in what we do. So what does the pediatric community want today? And I think I look at it from, a, from an ecosystem of patients, clinicians, hospitals, payers, researchers, and health systems. 
The patient wants a fast, reliable answer. Clinicians want support, streamlined processes. Hospitals really need to understand and want a one-stop shop that provides the best value, integrated reporting, and, and makes it easy for them to offer the best product to their patients for service. Payers want utility and value, and obviously the research community wants a large number of well-characterized samples that are scalable to enable discovery. So how do we address these needs at Claritas? As we think about the most important is the pediatric hospitals. They really want cost-effective, cutting-edge measurements that they know provide reliable, accurate interpretation for the patient. And they want partners who can enable the pediatric hospitals and our peers to build knowledge and advanced medical genomics for our pediatric patients. And it's important because the pediatric community is very different than the adult community. Because in many cases, if you can diagnose earlier the signs and translate that into a clear diagnos diagnosis for your patient, it leads to better treatment, better patient management, and better outcomes. So again, meeting patient needs, and let's go through this. So for the patients, it's really a fast, reliable answer. Genetic testing with consistent interpretation. So today, Claritas offers fast, reliable answers. We have a test menu offering over 110 tests currently offered that are all DNA-based tests. There's single gene tests that we offer now, and again, our website offers the list of these. We offer our first next-gen sequencing panel I say here as DMD, but it's really a neuromuscular um, panel, and we'll talk about that. That's a 10-gene panel. We offer a proprietary CNV array that is optimized for really defining regions that have been um, associated or found causative in autism. We will be offering next-gen sequencing exome-based tests in the fall as we roll out our strategy and our product menu more, more completely through things like ASHG and other meetings that will occur, and eventually genomes. But I think what we're aiming to do is use our assays, use the information in partnership with our clinic clinicians, our CLIA facility using a variety of technology platforms with the goal that we provide affordable, efficient, and analytical services that are scalable for um, using. Interpretation provides important clinical context. We use experts for the bioinformatics from Boston Children's, Harvard, Life Technologies, aiming to ensure consistent, scalable interpretation. And our clinical practitioners, we have a client services, which are expert genetic counselors, medical directors that are overseeing the uh, CLIA laboratory and so forth. And again, test menu all available. But we really operate in a collaborative way with our partners. So again, test services, exome genome, aiming to simplify. But the workflow really takes in a sample, we process it, we analyze it, and we report it. So how do we do that? Again, today we're using the Ion Torrent platform. Um, today we're offering our first next-gen sequencing panel that we've validated and verified in the production CLIA laboratory. We talk about the scale of the Ion Torrent being able in the future to offer a genome. To me today, I'm the $1,000 genome is a great aspirational goal, but today what I want, and I work with um, Life Technologies, to offer accurate clinical informative sequencing using the ion proton, starting with PGM and now moving to the ion proton. They have a trajectory that is exciting, and it's why we think it's the optimal choice for a clinical laboratory. The workflow is simple. The data analysis is simplified. The um, ability to scale the workflow leading up to um, the, um, the panels of genes that we will be offering in the future, you know, scales of 550 to 3,000 genes is highly workable 
in a time frame and a scale and a cost that's amenable to clinical decision making. Following the um, development of the sequence data, analysis, processing, signaling, scoring, annotating, and reporting, again, utilizes the data that we've generated from years already, but it will be building a new database of knowledge and information that we will continually be using for reporting better and in more informative information for our patients and the participants in the network. We have expert genetic counselors and medical directors that review reports and help in this interpretation, again, along with physicians in our network. We support a very streamlined process, helping the physicians up front navigate the test menu. When doctors have patients with complex presentation, family history, um, they have a long-term relationship. Typically, we provide post-reporting support reinterpretation services as we incorporate new knowledge into a test we did yesterday, six months from now, and so forth, and aiming to really streamline the ordering and in integration into hospital systems is the goal that we are aiming for. We do not have this available yet today, but we'll be growing. Navigating the menu again, taking the test selection tied to clinical presentation, how do we take away some of the guesswork upfront consultation to make sure the correct test is ordered? I think that in the pediatric community, clearly a world's um, leading expert group like Boston Children's Hospital will be much more sophisticated in their knowledge of test selection for um, a phenotype such as failure to thrive, muscle weaknesses, and so forth. But clearly the pediatric community at large um, may and definitely needs assistance in this, and again, we aim to provide that for them. For hospitals, again, one-stop shopping. How does a laboratory, how does a hospital, pediatric hospital in today's climate really understand the best value, the best service, the best test, and what we aim to provide is that one source for a hospital for managing their send-outs, for advising on testing for their physicians, and really helping them navigate the complex landscape. The, the kind of investment that is required for next-gen sequencing is not able to be brought to bear in every pediatric hospital. And every pediatric hospital may have particular areas of expertise that Claritas may not have. And therefore, as you build a network, there'll be the ability to, to provide a one-stop shop, but through the network, we'll be offering services that Claritas would provide as expertise, but another children's hospital may have an oncology expertise, for example, and we would aim to partner together so that it's seamless for the hospitals that are ordering. Again, I've talked a little bit about this, a one-stop shop, best value, integration, Today, hospital labs are spending millions and many millions of dollars to, in some cases, 50 to 60 testing laboratories for running DNA diagnostic tests. How do we work together as individual and groups of institutions that can now come together to better leverage and better negotiate for pricing, utilization guidelines to be based on evidence and best practices for the community, and really working together with some of the largest providers of testing services to make this a seamless experience for the pediatric hospitals. Again, consolidating molecular send-outs through a seamless process for the hospitals. Payers want utility and value, and that's where by building that knowledge through a network, we have the ability to go back to the payers with this autism test is the right test there's strong clinical justification, there's strong use, and there's a difference in how the patient is treated. Again, strong justification of value. Test menu arises from clinical needs, emphasis on ordering the right test, and really trying to utilize and be informative for cost savings. So I wanted to provide two examples of what we offer today. Um, today, one of the first um, examples I'd like to focus on is the example that we have of an array-based measurement, clearly something that's been used 
for a variety of disease indications, particularly in oncology, we have focused, again, on the germline and looking at copy number variations as they relate to autism spectrum disorder and offer a very unique proprietary product here at Claritas. This product that's used in concert with um, uh, a physician who sees a patient with developmental delays, including autism, is a product that has been developed through experience with looking at over 10,000 pediatric patients and allows the customization of the um, chip through a number of iterations to really maximize our ability to detect copy number variations in genes that are so relevant for this disease um, uh, indication. We've done a lot of compar comparison to other products that exist in the marketplace, and um, we believe we really have a superior product for this area. And we really have worked with world-class physicians who see these patients, are genetic experts, and it really allows us to help inform interpretation of our data that a physician would receive. We are using an Agilent a 4 by 180K um, uh, copy number and SNP array platform. Um, these are, uh, SNPs um, and copy number probes cover the whole genome. What we've done uniquely is we've shifted slightly from simply looking at, at random SNPs across the genome to really focusing in on regions that we know are important for detection of copy number variations. So for example, we know that um, we've focused our CNV probes of about 150,000 in regions of extreme importance for copy number variation that allows us to have exquisite sensitivity in genes of interest. Um, when we look at the coverage of our clinically relevant genes, um, we have a list of some 811 genes that have shown clinical relevance in this disease state that we have very definitive ability to look at copy number variations and genomic imbalances um, in regions um, that are covered on our chips. We include telomeres, centromeres, very much focused on the clinically relevant genes and have extremely good coverage to detect copy number variation, um, looking at 811 genes versus um, a competitor's chip, another vendor that has 228 um, genes densely covered for copy number variation of this particular phenotype. We have unique design features, again, that I said. What we've done is we've shifted some of the SNP probes that are sufficient to detect regions of loss of heterozygosity and so forth to maintain that, but removed particular probes from very common regions of copy number um, polymorphisms that exist in the majority of human genomes that you would see. And this is based on three iterations of our chips um, so that we can shift that coverage to regions that are particularly relevant um, with um, coverage and developmental delay genes, intellectual disability, autism spe spectrum disorders, and covering genes for haplo insufficiency. Um, I'd like to just show a few examples, and again, the difference being um, this is a particular gene that has been um, shown to be implicated in autism, the NRXN1 locus, and you see the very dense coverage that we offer across the Claritas um, gene region for this. We show a patient's DNA and the dense um, coverage of this gene and the exons of this gene and our ability to detect very fine regions of deletion in this particular patient sample. Same thing, this data has been published to show all the different deletions we've identified using this chip array. And then again, other genes, the STXB1 locus, again, dense gene coverage that allows you to detect very small regions of deletion and coverage across every exonic region. And the same thing with the FOXG1, where our ability um, is able to actually um, show in this gene, which is a single exonic gene, the requirement for the uh, detection of a deletion in a copy number region is a minimum of uh, three to five 
um, SNPs that are uh, show a deletion. And in ours, we have a total of 16 probes that cover this individual gene, and it allows you very accurately show the deletion of the Fox G1 gene in patients that are missing this. Another example that I'd like to highlight, again, a unique product of Claritas, is a next-gen sequencing panel involved in neuromuscular disorders and sequencing of these genes. Um, the background on neuromuscular disorders in pediatric patients, for those who may not be as familiar, is it is a group of disorders involving muscle and or direct nerve system control of those muscles. And these neuromuscular disorders occur in some 1.5 million Americans annually at any age, but importantly, some 40% of this disorder is first seen in pediatric patients under the age of 18. And these neuromuscular diseases are quite progressive in nature, result in, in extreme muscle weakness, fatigue, and could very dramatically alter the quality of life and do alter the quality of life for both patients and their families. It is an active area of research in rare disease um, therapeutic discovery and development. So I do think there's a bright, um, hopefully, future for understanding how best to deal with this, um, these disorders. Again, um, um, I'll refer to it as MND, um, genetic disorders. There's a variety involved in the neuromuscular uh, system. Um, there's a nice NCBI classification of these diseases. But let's talk about how we approach genetic testing in our CLIA laboratory. Um, it is phenotypic driven. So when a clinician sees a patient um, with presenting systems that are diverse um, and could include um, infantile um, floppiness, hypotonia, um, delay in walking, feeding, respiratory difficulties, abnormal gaits, cramps, elevated um, creatine kinase levels. This is um, very much a sign and symptom of neuromuscular um, disorder and could lead to the need for a better diagnosis of those symptoms through a genetic test such as our MND panel. This is a panel now that we've developed in concert with colleagues, um, Alan Baggs and Lou Conkel, and our colleagues from the DNA Diagnostic Laboratory here at BCH. It's a 10-gene panel, uses next-gen sequencing, um, and it's available to the community today. The first thing we do in, in um, detection of um, uh, neuromuscular disorder is many of these are caused by a, an exonic deletion duplication of the Duchenne muscular dystrophy gene or BMD gene. And so the first thing we do is we use a, um, a, a ligation-based probe detection, very simple assay, to look for these large deletions because approximately 60% of these patients can be classified um, as a DMD or BMD. Um, disease uh, relevant state by this first MLP assay to accept to assess large exonic CNVs. Following a negative result of that test, we would move then, and that's just some of the data that I want to move on. It's very easily detected. Following the detection of that deletion, the next thing we would do, or following the lack of detection of a deletion or duplication, we would move to sequencing of those genes using our panel, which is, again, a 10-gene panel covering well over 110 KB of gene sequence, um, including uh, uh, the, the genes depicted here um, for you and some large genes included here. We use an amplification-based method. So we're using an amplicon-based sequencing method. Um, this has now been very much optimized by um, the Life Technologies AmpliSeq exome product. However, we developed ours first using our own um, amplicon generation and automation process for generating our um, sequencing products and subsequent uh, sequencing on the ion torrent PGM instrument. Um, when you look at this, this is simply the coverage one sample of this on a small PGM chip 
um, and, and relatively inexpensive chip covers the gene well over 96% of the gene at greater than almost you know 2,000 x coverage. So as we're using this test in the initial phases, we're way over covering, we're validating everything we find in the patient by Sanger sequencing and building a large repository of information on exactly the ability of the ion torrent PGM to confirm with Sanger data. Um, and in some cases, actually the ion torrent um, PGM does better than Sanger. Um, where's that slide? Okay, we did initial validation studies, and I just wanted to, to, to talk about this initially. Obviously, the first thing we do in our research and development team is develop a validation plan for the assay, the number of samples that need to be run, the number of mutation positive samples that need to be run for confirmation, multiple runs, multiple samples. Um, we ran a validation study to assess the ability to identify 41 mutations. None of those mutations were missed. However, we had one interesting mutation that was classified as um, potentially missed. It was uh, seen in the um, ion torrent as a homozygote at a particular position in a gene. When we reran the Sanger, which suggested it was a heterozygote, in fact, it did confirm that it was a homozygote. So the, um, the PGM platform got that accurate. Um, again, the ability of the software to detect um, a report. In this case, the variant is reported in DDSNP as pathogenic in its homozygote condition and not heterozygote. That, so that's a very important correct classification based on the hetero, you know, is it a heterozygote, is it a homozygote? And we did get that correct as we went on. Sanger confirmation of variants, and this is just a plot which shows our 15 patients, the number of Sanger variants that were confirmed, all were confirmed, but we saw a variety of variants, and um, those are interpreted in a report. We check clinical significance of the SNP. We curate, we query our existing database if it's a novel. Um, we use informatics analysis to actually help in the interpretation of truly novel variants. We categorize, we score our variants. We have a reporting template that we use and we really focus very much on a high quality clinical services report back to the physician for this particular assay. We've um, just completed our first 11 clinical samples now in the CLIA laboratory. Again, I realize a small number, but this was a just released test. Um, we've identified one patient with a multi-exon deletion in DMD. Again, this is the first thing we do. Three patients with pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in um, FKRP, DMD, and CAPN3. Two patients with variants of unknown significance. And in, in the case of five patients out of the 11 in which we had no variant result that resulted in a significant information in the genes we surveyed um, in reporting back to the um, physician. So again, um, uh, uh, another aspect of our, uh, let me just stop and see if there are any questions also. No questions, we can move on. Um, another aspect of the community is really the research community and the ability of, um, the ability particularly in the pediatric genomics community where the individuals that you may see are very sometimes really one unique patient in your hospital and the ability to think about how you could coordinate efforts with another hospital that might have seen a similar phenotype and, and the ability to bring well-characterized samples together to scale and enable discoveries. And that's through a research data network that we are also um, aiming to build with the pediatric um, community. And this allows the creation of a data network in which high-quality data in a scalable for format is viewed as being automated with bio, via bioinformatics, ability to query. And I would say this is a much earlier phase in our company and thinking about how we could use this and leverage it to enable discovery. But we've had strong interest from the pediatric hospitals that we've talked to. And we now need to think about how we build this as a community. 
again, a data network, we need to ensure, sorry, that we have a HIPAA compliant, the consenting IRB, how do we share information, how do physicians, researchers contribute their data, how do we structure the data, how do we best represent the samples with these rare conditions, um, the systems and software to query, and we've been spending a lot of time looking at this with some very exciting solutions, enabling really population-based clinical pediatric studies. The data network, again, that we'd like to enable, global, really working to enable research that also would add to our knowledge of clinical variants. Again, imagine a scalable clinical and research network. We aim to really break down the barriers in the pediatric hospitals, aiming to work together as a community, consolidation and lowering of tests, and really helping hospitals understand where their area of expertise is, where our area of expertise is, and with the major investment that we've had from Life Technologies, really helping to facilitate scalability and sustainability as we really work at the cutting edge of science and technology in the clinical realm, which really ultimately is good for patients. So again, a whole variety of the realm of testing services, ordering, navigating menus, providing justification, strong clinical utilization, and eventually a research data scheme that we view would really help bring the community together for novel, enhancing novel gene discovery. Um, again, I talked about this. It's really about the right question, the right test, the right result, really bringing technology, cutting, truly cutting edge technology to the clinical scale today, which we are doing, and enhancing our ability to scale that and really offer, you know, the next panel, which will not be 10, which will be 20, which will be 50, which will be 500, which will be 3,000. So we really have a very far-reaching view, and we'll be talking much more about that over the coming months. And with that, um, Claritas Genomics, utilizing genomics to enhance pediatric health. Um, I will stop and we'll take questions, um, but I'd like to remind you that to obtain continuing education credits, you can go to the bioconferencelive.com, C-M-E, C-E, on a link that will allow you to address some of the questions that I've prepared that will allow um, you to demonstrate the knowledge that you've obtained from today's discussion. Um, and at this point, um, we have time for questions that I would love to entertain from the audience. And feel free to type your questions. Um, and uh, if not, um, either I've done a good job or it's still a new learning area for you, so don't be shy to type anything you're interested in. No questions. It must have been quite straightforward. Um, I, I guess I'm, and, and I'll work with Don, what I'm most curious about are, you know, the, the, oh, okay, so I did get a question. So the question I was just asked from um, Joy at Columbus Technical College, is there a list of disorders that you currently test for? And I would refer you to the Claritas Genomics website and look there at our test menu. Right now, it is not optimal for which disorders, although I think there's some information that you can glean as to which disorders. We're trying to optimize it for being phenotypically driven rather than we test for um, this gene, which is associated with this disorder. But feel free to take a look at that list and get in touch with us if we can help you with more information, Joy. It is quite far-reaching, I would say, and it is um, focused on, you know, gene sequencing, arrays for copy number, um, and so forth. Um, I have another question. Um, let me get to that question. Uh, and this is from uh, Abbas at Noble International University. And the question was, do you have any cooperation with any research center in Canada? 
Um, today, we do not. However, we are talking to a number of pediatric centers within the uh, Canadian community. So um, be on the look for that as we um, continue our discussions. Um, and we're very actively doing so now. Let's see who number three is. Oh, thank you very much. I had a nice comment on the fact that uh, they are um, admiring the work that we do. And believe me, when you walk in, you know, right now we are still located at Boston Children's Hospital. We'll be moving to Cambridge shortly. But when you walk in the doors of Boston Children's Hospital today, um, you can really understand why everyone who works at Claritas as a small company is so passionate about what we do um, and the excitement that we bring because we have a lot to do um, to solve the, the health care challenges that are um, seen every day in our children. Looks like we have no more questions and we're about out of time. I'm happy to stay um, and see if there are any more for the next few minutes. Um, I don't mind the silence because you may be thinking, um, but uh, um, it's an interesting format and uh, I hope it was informative for you. And again, you can find our website. Don't hesitate to get in touch with us if there's things we can help you with. Um, we, again, this is really our first opportunity to talk about the company. You'll see more um, from us um, shortly in the coming month of, of September and throughout as we continue to, uh, to launch new tests and really talk about the work that we do.